Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Global Online Ecological Niche Model Workshop, uh, ENM 2020. Um, uh, this is Geng Ping Zhu. I'm a social professor in Kenjin Normal University in China, uh, in a city which is very close to Beijing. Uh, currently, I'm working as a research associate, uh, research associate in Washington State University in the Department of Etymology. Today, I'm going to talk about the application of ecological niche model in biological invasion. Okay, I'm going to switch to the PowerPoint. The part of today's presentation that uh, implication of niche model in biological invasion. This slide shows a number of publications of niche model in different aspects of uh, biodiversity research, including global change biology, Conservation biology, I mean different different uh, kind of conservation biology and the biological version. The number uh, number of publication of niche model in this field is not so many like global change biology and conservation. But the number of publications uh, is still rising. I'm going to outline today's presentation. First, I will talk about the principle, the theoretical background of niche model in environment. Then I will use four species to illustrate niche model in, in environment. In the end, I will summarize the lessons that we can get from those four species, summarize those implications, which might be useful for you to develop a model in the future. The, okay, first the principle, the theoretical background. So first you need to understand what factors contribute to the distribution. Why you can observe the species there, but not in another, uh, I mean, in another area. So Tom Peterson and Hawke, they propose the BAM diagram. They use three circle to, I mean, describe those uh, distribution, which is including abiotic, biotic, and, uh, and the movement. Imagine when you observe the species in a field, when you detect the species there, it, it must fall into the overlap of the three circles. First, this area must, 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 I mean, must fall into the biological requirement of the species. Also, in the community, the species, I mean, can survive, can develop, can development means that the biotic interaction is good, it's okay for the species to survive. So this area also, I mean, fell into the uh, movement area. It's accessible, this area is accessible to the species. That's why you can detect them there. So the overlap of the three circles represents uh, the real life distribution or observed distribution. There are overlaps between A and B, but not M, which means that these areas are suitable for the species that the species can survive there, but the species haven't, I mean, moved there. All those areas are not accessible to the species. We call this area as partition distribution. Keep in mind this hypothesis based on the niche, niche conservatism. I'm going to, I'm not going to talk about this topic here, but I will mention it in later. In microecology, there's a classical conclusion that uh, different factors function at a different scale to control species distribution. Usually, climate factors they are function at broader scale, like global, continental, where those biotic interactions that they are function at a relatively small scale, including local site. There are also other factors. So. In this slide, you need to understand the relationship between geographical space and the environmental space. So, in the up figure, that is the uh, environmental space uh, x x is uh, can be treated as the temperature, the y x can be treated as the precipitation. So the blue point, I mean the class is the blue point in the environmental space, their projection into the geographical space can be separate. I mean. So, which means that the cluster in the environmental space, their projection in, I mean, back to the geographic space, those parts cannot, might not be clustered. They can be disjunct or separately distributed. 
So niche model fits the, the model in the geographic space. They use the environmental variables that are associated with the point, which I mean manifest as the latitude and the longitude. They use those variables to calculate the requirement of species or to calculate the niche. These calculates the niche can be, I mean, project back again to the geographic space. They can project to the area where you have fit your model, or you can project the, the estimated niche to another space. Here rather an issue of transferability. I will talk about this issue later. So this correlative approach of each model is very simple. They use the occurrence and the environmental layers to estimate the partition distribution. If you all want to learn much background of niche model application, take a look at this book, Ecological Niche and Geographical Distribution, which is simple and easy to follow. Even if you have no idea of biology, no idea of ge geography, you still can understand the theoretical background, the principle of a niche model. There are two approaches of niche model application in biological environment. One is a classical native model approach, which uses occurrence in the native area, and the other approach is a global model approach, which uses both native and introduced point, I mean, uses a pulled point to collaborate the model. So they have an advantage and a dis and disadvantage. For example, native model is based on the population of equilibrium, which is the key exception of niche model application. It can estimate the partition distribution. But native model have two disadvantages, which are very important. Like a low niche model transferability, I mean the native model prediction in the introduced error, their prediction rate is very bad. So they have also analytic climate variable issue, which means the variable that are beyond the model fitting errors. So the variables are novel to the model projection in the introduced errors. So global model, they didn't have those kind of uh, two disadvantages, but it's based on population of non equilibrium. Also the predictions of global model, they have a problem that is Usually the prediction is clustered around your observed point, which is very useless in your very knowledge. So I prefer the native model approach. I think about Halama uh, Palace. This think bug is native to East Asia, but has been introduced in Europe and uh, North America. In East Asia, it is not a serious, I mean, pet, it's not a serious problem. But in the especially in the Middle Atlantic area, it is the serious part, especially through the first trees. Here I use the native mode approach. I collaborate the model in the East Asia and transfer it to the mainland US. I use two environment data sets. One is using 10 variables, the other is using um, six variables. Left side A indicate model will collaborate in East Asia using 10 variables, where the right side B indicate model will collaborate in East Asia using six variables and transfer it to mainland US. From this figure, we can see that the model based on six variables shows much, I mean, get much better performance. Uh, take a look at the omission error. We cannot see any difference of the omission error in the native error, but when the model was transferred onto the mainland US, we can see that the model based on six variables showed much low omission error, those black circles, um, compared to the model based on the 10 variables. So this, uh, this result showed us that it's especially important to think about the dimensionality, which means how many variables you should consider, and uh, what kind of variable you are going to select. It's very important on model transferability. The issue is maximum complexity. Maximum is so popular, but we find that currently it is well recognized that maximum has some problem. Maximum tend to overfitting. They are only uh, transferable at the low threshold, and the fine-tuned maximum model setting is much better than the default setting. 
I use this think bug. I I use ARC to refine the model setting and compare the response curve with those default setting. So from this figure, we can see that the fine tuned setting, I mean, uh, the model predictions their their response curve is much smoother. Uh, those dotted red lines is much smoother than 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 a response curve based on the default setting. So model based on this, I mean, based on the fine tuned setting, suggests that we are approaching, I mean, the fundamental niche which is much transferable. So the, their special the prediction is also different. So especially, I mean, based on default setting and the fine-tuned setting, especially in the southern hemisphere. The second case study, I use uh, uh, assorted, uh, uh, assorted uh, co a code grass, which uh, this code grass, it's, uh, they have very special, very featured distribution because they are only distributed along the coast. They cannot disperse into the inland. So here I collaborate the model based on the coastal area and based on the squared area. So from this example, I show the importance of the geographic background in each model predictions. I collaborate the model in a native area, in, I mean, across North and South America, and transfer model onto the Easter Asia to show the model, uh, to compare the model performance. It's similar to the former stink bug. So based on the squared background, the model field to capture and introduce the I mean, distribution of this code grass in Easter Asia. But model based on the coast ground showed much better performance. Take a look at those two, uh, those two black, uh, black arrows that shows the current distribution of this code grass in East Asia. The importance of model of accessible area in model predictions. In the, in the third example, I'm going to use the Western Continent for seed bug to show the importance of the geography background and the equilibrium states. So this species is native to Western North American, but has uh, it, it starts to expand its population in early 19s and uh, become an introduced species in Europe and Japan. It was also intercepted by in China. So model based on the classic native approach, based on a small native western range, successfully captured the eastern expansion population and also the introduced population in Europe. That's amazing of the native model approach. Based on large area, based on the whole now, based on the whole American North American, I mean area, it's varied based on it varied with the presumed states of equilibrium. So based on the equilibrium, based on the equilibrium states, that the model successfully captured the population in Europe. Where the model based on non equilibrium states, they are failed to capture the predictions, to capture the, the range in Europe. I also showed that the more, I also compared those model performance based on the omission error and RC curve, which is very powerful to examine the model performance across the multiple threshold. Let's see the last example. I'm going to use the last uh, example to show the uncertain niche model prediction and how to use a consistent model approach to overcome those uncertainties and uh, what's the best method to overcome those, those uncertainties. So this species is a uh, fall uh, webworm. It's a moss. It's native to America, but become an introduced species in Europe and uh, Eastern Asia. Uh, it's not a serious problem in American, but it's a very serious problem in Asia and Europe. In native area, there are at least three forms, the black-headed, red-headed, and a mosaic of those, those two headed. So, but only the red, but only the black-headed form had become introduced species in, uh, in Europe and Asia. So it's a serious problem in China right now. It's only and damage the broadleaf trees. So it's a, it's a very serious problem right now.
So I here is uh, this figure shows the expansion of the species in China. It first established population in Liaoning province, and then after that expansion very fast to the north and south. Currently, it seems that this species was blocked. It, it was blocked to the expansion towards the west by the mountains. So I here I use four environment data set. Uh, first, I compared the climate space occupied by the native population and the introduced population in Asia and Europe. The four environment data set was including first here is all variables. So the first all variables including nine, those 19 biocolimate variables. Then the second is uncorrelated variable by removing those highly correlated variables. The third is JKNIF the data set which selects a subset of those all, those all variables based on the JKNF test of those variable importance of, of the variable relevance in species distribution. So the last data set is the PCE data set. I select the PC, PC1 to 5 to select to use for the climate space comparison. So the variables, so the climate space comparisons between native and introduced population based on those four data set, they show a the different degree of niche expansion and niche unfeeding. So I use four variable, four data sets and uh, six algorithm, six model approach. So generate all the models based on the native area and transferred to East Asia. So the mod those individual models shows much variety in the in their ability to capture the introduced part. So the the progress model that we get is GEM based on the uncorrelated data set. It failed to capture the points, introduce the point. The best model we get, the I mean the the model that shows the best uh, transferability, is GLM model based on the all variables. So the consensus model it seems based uh, based on it's felt into those two extremes. So I take I take a careful comparison of those individual models. So it seems that models based on the JKNF data set showed a low emotion error compared to those three data set, which means that it's very important to select the relevance variable, the variable that's controlling the species distribution. I also compared the models that uh, based on the different method to, I mean, to generate the consensus model. So here is uh, here is the method that based on uh, here is the four method used to generate the constant model, which mean which is mean media, PCA media and a weighted error. If you want to, to if you want to learn how to generate the PCA media approach based on I mean how to how to use PCA media approach to generate the constant model, you can take a look at our paper. So from this figure, we can see that a model based on the PCA media approach showed a lot of motion error compared to the other approach. Those red, those gray line indicates the individual model, where the red line indicates the constant model based on different subset of all the individual models. Okay, let's move to the last section, right? Uh, the lessons, the implications of those for case studies. So before that, I would talk about the low niche model transferability that was reported um, in several studies. And the author also gets concluding that based on the niche, uh, low niche model transferability that they conclude that niche would shift. However, uh, later research shows that those a conclusion is quite artifactual. It is mainly because of the environment data set methods. So it's really important that if we can estimate the fundamental niche, and uh, if the niche, if that niche had been conserved over the time uh, during the environment process. So this is very important. So all the native niche model approach that should be based on this hypothesis. Then the niche model should be able to, I mean, anticipate the full partition distribution of the species. It's really important.
So the implications uh, summary, I would like to outline those points that so first, before modeling, you should know the organism that you are going to model. So you should know uh, where they are living, what's the habitat requirement, uh, what's, uh, what's their biogeographical history. And yes, it's really important. You should know the general biology background, all the information. So the dimension and dimension, dimensionality issue that uh, keep in mind, it's better select five to eight variables. Too many variables are not necessary. It also can, I mean, too many variables can lead to a complex model and reduce the model transferability. So it's really important that you have to delimit this, uh, a proper area for your model because those areas reflect whether the species have the potential to move there. So the importance of accessible area in each model collaboration is very, in, you should be keep this in mind. Uh, find a better way to delimit this area. So there are several approach available to delimit those areas. So I would like to recommend you to think of the species in your environmental space rather than geographic space. Because in your environmental space, you will know that the response curve, the species requirement, uh, why your model prediction looks like this, but not that. So it's, re it's recommended that you take a look at the, the species that, uh, in environment space and compare the, the climate space occupied by different populations. Uh, the their result is very important when you interpret your spatial prediction. So the last uh, I would uh, last of this slide I would recommend you think about the model complexity because it's currently it's the most important issue in each model. So take a look at the response curve rather than simply look at the uh, map predictions. So what's your response curve looks like? Are they smooth or are they? I mean zip code like this so uh, take a look at the response curve i mean it's better to before you take a look at the special prediction so also if you think about the population status whether the species that you are going to model whether it's stable or it's still expansion so because it's the key assumption of each model application uncertainty i would like to if you find that if you're not satisfied with your model prediction, I recommend you to try different model approach, different algorithms. So, uh, and see what the model looks like because they are certain in each model predictions. So you can try individual or consensus model or sample model approach. Uh, they have an advantage, disadvantage. But you should be careful about that uh, consensus models do have uncertainty because the different methods that use to produce those consensus models, there are also variations among those consensus models. Okay, that's it. So if you have uh, some questions, you can, I think you have send me an email to me or to this program or to this uh, workshop. I'm happy to answer your question. So that's today's presentation. Uh, thank you all. Bye bye. Uh, in environment space and compare the the climate space occupied by different populations. Uh, the their result is very important when you interpret your spatial prediction. So the last uh, I would uh, last of this slide I would recommend you think about the model complexity because it's Currently, it's the most important issue in each model. So take a look at the response curve rather than simply look at the uh, map predictions. So what's your response curve looks like? Are they smooth or are they, I mean, zip code like this? So uh, take a look at the response curve. I mean, it's better to before you take a look at the special prediction. So. Also, you should think about the population status, whether the species that you are going to model, whether it's stable or it's still expansion. So because it's the key assumption of each model application. 
On Saturday, I would like to, if you find that, if you're not satisfied with your model prediction, I recommend you to try different model approach, different algorithms. So, uh, and see what the model looks like because they are certain in each model predictions. So you can try individual or consensus model or sample model approach. Uh, they have an advantage and disadvantage, but you should be careful about that uh, consensus models do have uncertainty because different methods that use to produce those consensus models, there are also variations among those consensus models. Okay, that's it. So if you have some questions, you can, I think you have send me an email to me or to this program or to this uh, workshop. I'm happy to answer your question. So that's today's presentation. Uh, thank you all. Bye-bye.